everyone. This is Steve Marinucci, freelance writer on Billboard, Variety, and Access.com, and the author of the book Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones, welcoming you to another Things We Said Today, where we talk about the Beatles' past, present, and maybe to come. Let me introduce the two co-hosts of the show. First, um, the former head of the Beatle desk at the New York Times, and the author of The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, uh, Alan Cosen. Uh, hello, Alan. Hello, Steve. Hello, everyone. And the host of the show, Every Little Thing, um, that just announced a new syndication thing today, Ken. Congratulations. Um, you, can you can tell what that is. Um, Mr. Ken Michaels. Thank you, Steve. And hi, everybody. Maybe we should talk about it at the end of the show. Okay. We can do that. Okay. We have a, we have a very, very special guest um, on board with us tonight, and um, I want to welcome Mr. Elliot Mintz, who, whose name will be known to Beatle fans um, everywhere. He's known very much for his association with John and Yoko, but he's represented so many people. And I, every time you post pictures, Elliot, of your of your clients, I, it's, I I'm like amazed that that you know of all the people you've worked with. But first, I want to welcome you to the show. Thank you for for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Let me get started. I mean, I'll, I'll ask the basic question, and then we'll go around the table. But how did you meet up with John and Yoko? It began first as a radio interview. I was on a local radio station in Los Angeles doing you know telephone talk radio and uh, interviewing uh, public figures on the air. I had gotten a copy of Yoko's newest release at that time, and I did uh, an interview with uh, Yoko, uh, a phoner. She was in New York, I was in L.A. I think we talked for about an hour. It went well. It went very well. And um, a day or two later, or maybe the next day, she just called me, and uh, thanked me for the interview, saying that she enjoyed it very much, and it was a pleasure talking. You guys are all veterans of the media, and you know that after you finish doing an interview with most people on planet Earth, that's the last you ever hear of them until they want to promote something and they contact you again. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody had ever called me back to thank me for doing an interview with them. It impressed me. I told her that. It began a telephone relationship, a telephone friendship that went on for quite some time. There came a point where either she suggested or I suggested or we suggested or thought it would be a good time uh, to talk to John, who had just uh, released Imagine. So it was in 1971, on the eve of his uh, birthday, that I uh, did a phoner with John on the air. And not surprisingly, or perhaps still surprisingly, the next day he called me and he said that he really liked the way that interview went. And he just, he liked the vibe of it. It's posted up on my website the first time we ever spoke. And um, he liked some of the questions that I asked him, and word association games, things of that nature. And the three of us became phone pals. And we spoke every day for the months that would follow. And when I say every day, I mean, they, they get up uh, very early in New York, and uh, I'm an insomniac, and uh, when I'm ready to go to sleep, they're ready to wake up. We would sometimes spend four, five, six hours on the phone. I would start with one of them and while the other was doing something else, and they would hand me off. I don't think we ever did... Conference, you know, like a conference call. Maybe they didn't even have them then. Mm -hmm. uh, one day they, d they decided to get into a car and drive cross country. This was in 1971. And John had only seen America from an airplane and Yoko had not seen it at all. So with a friend of theirs driving a vehicle that I always describe as an old rambler, but it's probably a different type of car, they drove across country. They wound up in a place, uh, oh, uh, 75, 80 miles north of Los Angeles, and uh, called me and said, we're here, let's meet. They gave me the address of where they were parked in a field near a place called Ojai, California, huh. not far from Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. I got in my car, drove up, pulled up alongside their car, 
as it was described to me. And uh, the door opened, and uh, it was Yoko. And um, John said, go on, give him a hug. And uh, I hugged her, and then him. And that was how we met. Wow. That's incredible. Mm. That's, that's, I've never heard that story before. That's great. That's fantastic. They were renting a little house in that area, and they told me to follow their car. I did. We went back to this little uh, modest uh, rental, and um, I spent the afternoon with them. And uh, John uh, gave me a copy of Sometime in New York City, an acetate. And he said it had not been played before, probably for good reason. <laughs> and uh, when the day was over and the sun was setting, he, uh, both of them uh, autographed the, uh, the acetate to me. And I went right back to L.A., went on the air, told the engineer, I've got the new release of John and Yoko's. Obviously, I hadn't heard it. I was just in my car. Mm -hmm. And uh, he put it on the turntable. And I announced uh, you know, to my audience had the good fortune of uh, getting this for you tonight, so let's hold the commercials and let's just drop the tone arm needle at the beginning and listen to the various cuts of the new John and Yoko album sometime in New York City. And I listened for the first time through headphones and 15 minutes into the experience, I felt that I should pull out the old resume uh, because this was not going to go over well with station <laughs> management. <laughs> was it both I was subsequently, I, I, I was subsequently fired, <laughs> and I called the two of them, and I, I told John, uh, I've got good news and bad news, and the good news is I played the album, uh, the entire album, every song from beginning to end. It was heard all over Southern California. And uh, he was uh, just joyous. He said, that's great. That's effing great. Uh, mother, <laughs> which is what he called Yoko, uh, he played the whole record. He played the whole record. And uh, I said, and for the bad news, uh, I'm told that the station is thinking of taking a different direction. And he cracked up again and said to Yoko, they fired him. <laughs> uh, the two of them found that amusing. And um, he said, what are you going to do? And I said, I guess I'm going to look for a job. And he said, well, um, we're going up to San Francisco. Why don't you uh, tag along with us? I did. I would spend uh, days with them in San Francisco. And um, it cemented our relationship and our friendship. And uh, for the next seven, eight years that uh, followed till the end, that's how it was. Wow. So you could be the only person on the planet fired for getting an exclusive John Lennon recording <laughs> and playing it first on the Well, air. let's say the only person who might be fired for playing songs such as The Pope Spunk's Dope <laughs> right. and Attica State and um, Woman is the End of the World and Free Angela Davis and, you know, other <laughs> pop ditties that... Uh, you know, just were not clear channel radio material at the uh -huh. time. Can, can I ask what station it was, Elliot? Yeah, it was KLOS radio. Was, was it really? Wow. It, huh. And it was owned and operated by ABC. Wow. Wow. Did they, did they say something to you like, we just don't believe in John's politics and this is not suitable for the station? Or were they just against what John stood for you at that what? moment? If you've ever worked uh, for a radio station, and I guess m many of our friends who are listening right now probably have never found themselves in that situation, but nobody ever seems to be fired. I was fired from every radio station I ever worked on. I think I was on eight different radio stations, and there came a time when I was uh, let go for some misdeed. They never give you a specific reason. It always begins with something like, you know, we're so pleased with everything you do and your numbers are so good and I don't want you to take this personal but the, the station is thinking of going in a different direction you know, experiment with a different sound and you, you would know uh, you know I, I by that time I had come and gone from a few of the stations you kind of know when they ask you to come into the station at nine o'clock in the morning to have a conversation mm. Mm -hmm. I know 
So, <laughs> did, I, don't, I, I don't. I don't know if they. Did, if it was just a question of disagreeing with John's politics, I think it may have had something to do with uh, how should we refer to it today? Language sensitivity. Mm. That, uh, in those days, there were certain words that uh, people would find uh, objectionable in management on air. It was very, very, very different than extraterrestrial radio and all the stuff we have now where people say whatever they want. But back in 1971, this goes back, if any uh, of your listeners go back to listen to sometime in New York City, I would dare to say that there may be one or two numbers that wouldn't be played today. Oh, yeah, well, sure. I, I can tell you for a fact, because I've been doing radio programs on the Beatles for, well, it's now 36 years, and I still mm -hmm. will get feedback from program directors asking me, they, they will not want me to play Woman is the Negro of the World. You right. know, it seems like of all the songs that John recorded, do not play that one. It doesn't matter what the message is of the song, because of the use of that word, you can't use it because you, you might offend some people. And I still get that. <laughs> uh, and that was the incendiary song title and the use of that word uh, that uh, rang all the bells off the hook. That people got to, in management, they got as far as to just hear that Elliot played a song with that word in it mm -hmm. in 1971. And they were, uh, that was uh, the deal closer. And again, as you say, if anybody listens to it, listens to it and what it means, in no way is it a derogatory song aimed at black people. The word just, it was Jones' belief that a woman was the slave to the slaves. Right. That we make her paint her face and dance. It was a, it was a pro-feminist song. And, you know, John, uh, that was the word that was going to be the attention getter. Right. And if he had to use that language in that or if, or if he was doing, he's used language in other materials as well. And, of course, uh, that kind of language would crop up in interviews uh, as well as songs. Mm -hmm. Just look at Lenin Remembers, the book. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So John was, John was not an expert in terms of self-censorship and could have never been an undercover agent. Uh, if he felt it, he shared it. And there were no secrets. And he would do that uh, professionally, and he would do that personally. And if you offended him in some way, uh, he'd let you, you were always certain where you stood with John. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Alan, uh, I'll, let you take, I'll let you take the next question. Well, you know, we'd like to talk a, a, a bit about Lost Lennon tapes, but um, I, I just thought I'd ask first what you're, you're up to now and um, also how Yoko's doing. Thanks for asking about Yoko. I saw her um, in February uh, mm -hmm. for her 85th birthday, if one can believe that. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a small gathering up at the Dakota. Uh, probably 40 people attended. Uh, she just wanted kind of the, the folks that she had known throughout the course of her life uh, that showed up and people who used to uh, work with them would be friends. People like Bob Gruen were there and Cindy Lauper. And what she also did, uh, Sean has his own contingency of um, people in their 30s and 40s that have come to know Yoko who visit with her because Sean sees her constantly. Um, there was... 15 of Sean's friends and Yoko's friends as well. So we all mixed together. Uh, Yoko, uh, Sean played piano and Cindy and, and uh, Yoko sang together. They sang Imagine, mm -hmm. two other songs. She was in, uh, by the way, it was in that very room, what's called the white room, the living room, the room that looks out over strawberry fields. That was the room that I met Sean in when he was, one week old mm. when his parents called and said we want you to come to new york to meet our boy and i uh, flew there and i remember when john brought him out and sat down on the couch and that's where i was to yoko's 85th talk about the long and winding road with sean you know three feet from me the birthday was inspiring mm. 
she seemed very, very uh, upbeat and friendly, engaging and interacting with all the people who were there. It was a fabulous party. And uh, as for me these days, well, I, I like to describe myself as being semi-retired. Mm-hmm. I'm not uh, working the way I used to work. I'm not on the air anymore. Um, I do some media consultation work when people want my advice as to how they could advance uh, whatever media programs they might be involved with, kind of public relations stuff. And uh, I try and be active in philanthropic causes, utilizing whatever skills I may have learned in media to help make the world a slightly better place by helping with fundraising events. And the rest of the time, I do uh, the stuff that uh, I didn't really have a chance to do when I was on the Magical Mystery Tour. I go horseback riding, I meditate, I sleep late, I do some creative writing, I spend more time with my friends. I'm thinking of going back to school and taking some late night classes and subjects that uh, interest me. I really sit down to uh, read books, I go hiking, uh, I travel to places that I want to travel to. This is a fairly sweet time in my life right now, thank the Lord. That's great. Oh, good for you. Yeah. So this is actually the, I think, 30th anniversary of the Lost Lennon Tapes this year, or the, the of when it started. Mm. It started in 88. Um, and mm. back then, um, you and I did an interview for the New York Times about the show, and I also spoke to Yoko and some other people. And um, I was just reading the the piece that I wrote about it and early on it seemed to be a fairly only semi-formed idea. I mean, Yoko hadn't listened. She said she didn't really have the heart to listen to all the stuff. She just handed over 300 hours of tape to Westwood One. Mm -hmm. And I think implicit in the deal was that you would be involved because she trusted you. And, um, but also the first shows, I mean, uh, what they had told me at the time I did this piece is that even Westwood One hadn't gone through all the tapes yet. They were only working a couple of weeks ahead on the shows and they only expected it to run for 52 weeks and it ran for what, 219. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, I was just sort of wondering what you remember of that early part, you know, maybe right before it went on the air, when, you know, being confronted with this huge trove of interviews and demos and outtakes and everything. And what did you think about how it would come together? And, uh, you know, how did it eventually sort of take shape? Uh, first of all, uh, when you say it's been 30 years, uh, virtually, uh, uh, you know, well, more than half my adult lifetime ago. Mm-hmm. It, uh, it's chilling. But I, re- I do recall some specific details uh, with ease. Uh, Yoko and I were at the Dakota one day, and uh, the subject of tapes came up, uh, you know, stuff that John had left behind. Mm-hmm. And she wasn't quite certain what to do with it because the, the, it was the nature of these tapes, rehearsal tapes, unfinished material, spoken word tapes, John jamming, uh, just a variety of different things that would not necessarily uh, be suitable for general commercial release on an, on an album, mm-hmm. uh, material that wouldn't just be played on the radio automatically because it was John. Uh, you know, it was the, the evolution of the songs. It was a, a living, breathing biography, I imagine, the longest-running biography of a single person in the history of broadcasting, I mm. think. Mm-hmm. And oh. and Yoko had just kind of put that out in the air to me, uh, what to do with the tapes, what to do with the tapes. And at the time, I was doing public relations work for a man named Norman Pattis, P-A-T-T-I-Z, mm-hmm. who was the CEO of a company called Westwood One Radio, at that time, the largest syndicator of radio programs around the world. And uh, one day, Yoko was in town, and I had mentioned to Norm my conversation with her, the tapes, and he said, wow, unreleased tapes, tapes that have never been heard? Well, you know, I've got a broadcast network that goes around the world. Could, could you set up a meeting? 
I called Yoko and I said, I think I might have uh, an idea for where the tapes could go. I arranged a dinner. The three of us went out to dinner. They met. They got along with each other. By the time dinner was over, the deal was sealed. Uh, she said that that seemed like the perfect place for them to air. He couldn't have been more thrilled. And um, one of them suggested that uh, it would not be a bad idea for me to be the host because I had some broadcasting experience and they were friends of mine. And uh, I loved this uh, material. That's how it began. Uh, I think, you know, the lawyers looked at the papers for a day or a day and a half, signed it. And the next thing I knew, uh, I was picking up uh, FedEx boxes that had been shipped from New York. And we brought them to uh, the Westwood One Studios. Of course, it was daunting because these 90% of the material were on little, the old-fashioned cassette tapes. Okay. And all of them had to be analyzed, digitalized. Some had not been moved in their spindles for a dozen or two dozen years. We didn't want to break the tape. Everything had to be cataloged and organized and archived. You can't just put your hand in the middle of it. Sometimes material that's misidentified, sometimes tapes that just have a question mark on it or a scratch, which I would recognize as being in John's hand, handwriting, or the kind of um, pencil pens that he used to use at the time. So with one, two, or three very competent engineers, Stephen Peoples was one of the, um, the producers of the show at the time, uh -huh. a man with a very, very organized, uh, structured uh, mind uh, with, who exhibited great sensitivity to this material, all of it original, none of it yet duplicated. If anything happened to them, they were gone forever. Mm -hmm. So we took our time. We took our time. And even when the show began, we were always uh, still in the process of hundreds of hours of duplication and digitalization. And then, of course, the writing of each one of these. These were one-hour uh, produced radio shows, and the material had to be researched verified, cross-referenced. I think there was only one occasion when we had to call something back where we made an error. And uh, I didn't write the shows. They were written by uh, Stephen and then later by others. Uh, I was really uh, just the voice. But, I mean, it was a massive, massive undertaking. And, and for the people who enjoyed it, well, I, I was told by Westwood One that the first uh, episode, which was three hours long, uh, was listened to by six million people on American airwaves, mm -hmm. and it was mm. then uh, s syndicated to other countries. The BBC would not air it uh, because of my voice. Really? Why? Talk about really? Talk about linguistic chauvinism. Um, <laughs> no, the, the the position of the BBC is the BBC is for BBC announcers right. who speak <laughs> in English mm. to talk. And not this renegade ex-New Yorker from Hollywood, California, speaking on their air. So, couldn't go back there. So that was more important to them than having access to 300 hours of unreleased John Lennon. Good to know. Well, um, <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't want to be the only guy in town to ever uh, speak negatively about the BBC. That I have the greatest respect in the world for them, and they are the the broadcasting outlets of record to the world. And, you know, mm -hmm. I'm enamored by them. But at that time, I don't know what it is today. The policy was it is the British Broadcasting Company and not. So it's perfectly fair, perfectly fair. I, I, I didn't take offense at it. Hmm. OK, interesting. Uh, so in in this piece, um, I had listened to, I guess, the first few shows had come out by the time I wrote, and um, some of them seemed like there wasn't enough unreleased material to me, and, you know, they were like 15 minutes per hour, and it, it evolved a lot very quickly, and uh, even by the time this piece came out, I had said that it was getting a lot more organized, and it 
ends with a discussion of something in a way that you just mentioned about how it, it ended up being the longest biography of a single person on, on radio. Um, I want to read you your quote because it, it's really kind of interesting. <laughs> you were saying that, uh, you know, the series as a whole would be a realistic portrayal of John Lennon as a man and artist. And then the quote was, look, Mr. Mint said, <laughs> There's a lot of material to be covered here. Some of it will amuse you, some of it will make you feel weird, and some will make people very angry. John's nature was to make you feel. He had the courage to say, through his songs, that he felt crippled inside, that he was a jealous guy, that he suffered from isolation. He screamed for help and about going through cold turkey, and he chanted about giving peace a chance. His music was not designed to make you feel sweet, mushy, and lovey all the time, so the show is not going to be rock and roll music, nor will it be voyeuristic. What I want to present is a celebration of who John Lennon was, a portrait of Lennon without tears. So this was at the very beginning. How do you feel looking back after the whole series um, about um, how you achieved that? I said that? You said it. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise, surprises me. I, I mean, that, that's pretty damn good. I, uh, Not bad. I, I, I wish I was half as articulate today as I was. You must have caught me in a very, very good night. That sounds like a second Chardonnay stream of thought consciousness. <laughs> but, uh, have been, yes. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ditto everything that Elliot said and, uh, and <laughs> said it better then than he could say it now, because, yes, but. That does sum it up, you know. He was, he was a provocateur. You know, that's one of the reasons we're still talking about him. He, he raised a lot of questions for us to answer ourselves. He gave us his opinion, but he uh, he insisted that we uh, acquire our own. He did not want people to follow him or, uh, you know, just rubber stamp uh, his belief systems. This is where he stood, and then he held up the cosmic reflective mirror and say, so where do you stand? What moves you? What touches you? What are your relationships like? Uh, you know, have... Conversations with John were not um, dictatorial in nature, and uh, he was as good a listener as he was a speaker when he was interested in the subject matter. Mm -hmm. And in our uh, conversations, and keep in mind this was a, a Although it was, you know, from 71 to 80, uh, it wasn't that many years, but it had to have been thousands of hours of, uh, of, of talk between us, primarily on the phone, but, you know, visits across country. The two of them attended two of my birthdays in Laurel Canyon. Um, and we traveled to Japan together and other places. When he was pensive and reflective, I like to give him his space just to withdraw and think. I think it was uh, Jack Nicholson. I interviewed him and I he said, tell me the biggest disadvantage of being a celebrity, being a public figure. And he said something, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, well, hell, let me tell you, <laughs> you're, never, you're never ever allowed to contest your own silence. <laughs> so... Uh, when anybody meets a public figure, they meet them carrying with them all the baggage and perceptions. They've got lots of stuff to say to their newfound friend. The public figure is just meeting a stranger without the benefit of the biographical information. So all that he or she continues to hear is stuff that they've lived through and have reviewed a thousand times over. John needed the time to be silent. And he needed the time for people around him to be silent and obviously not to talk about Beatles or music or reunions or any of that. So I tried to give him as much of that space as possible. We took some very lengthy airplane rides uh, where we just sat together and uh, he wasn't speaking and I wasn't uh, attempting to make small talk. And then after a certain amount of time, he would volunteer something. He would say something. And when he was animated and excited, uh, nothing could stop him. Mm -hmm. In many ways, the 215, 20 hours, however many hours uh, we, we had, yes, they were, you're quite right, Alan, that in the beginning, 
there wasn't enough of the the discovered lost Lenin tapes. There was a lot of existing material as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that was unfortunate. And I think it was due to the fact that we were just getting our feet wet. Mm-hmm. And in the beginning, we didn't even know where all, you know, we had no idea of knowing what was coming or what material was there. Every time we found something, it was like a nugget in the cave. Let's get this out and put it up immediately. And if we have to buy some extra time while we're searching, so you'll find that the shows, you know, from 50 to 100 or from 150 to 200 were far more rich in terms of their complexity. Mm-hmm. Uh, we all learned together. And then, you know, there did come a time when I looked at those shelves behind the fireproof cabinets in Westwood One in the vault, and uh, there were just a handful of cassettes left on the wall, and there was no way, uh, I mean, we we played the last tape. It, It spun out, and when that was gone, there was no more. So there really isn't a lot of stuff that we didn't get to hear. Well, people have asked me that over the years, if there, were, if there is somewhere, you know, material. And I have reason to believe that there are still tapes somewhere. John was kind of secretive with uh, how he handled his personal recordings. I mean, all of the Apple material, all of the Beatles material, all of the stuff that they recorded at Abbey Road, well, to the best of my knowledge... That has all been archived, cataloged, filed, uh, cross-referenced, and they knew exactly what they have, audio and video. It, it couldn't be a more organized library. And I don't know if there'll be any, quote, new discoveries, you know, the, the completed song that fell behind the console. I don't know about that. Right. In the case of John or John and Yoko, if he did a cassette and at the end of the cassette he labeled it Alan Watts lecture from KPFK <laughs> and put it in a night table drawer, is it possible that some something like that is somewhere? I did uh, a real dutiful search uh, to the best of my ability through every source that I could tap into to find material, but I was I was one guy there might be people holding something precious. Uh, it, it would it would not surprise me. Now, certainly not, you know, albums or not un, uh, unreleased John Lennon original songs that you've never heard of. I don't know about that. But other snippets that could give us some insight into who he was musically, I don't think there'll ever be an end to that quest. It depends how hard one wants to look. Mm-hmm. Okay, I should hand you over to Ken. Ken? Thank you, Alan. Hi, Elliot. And uh, boy, I've got so many questions I'd love to ask, even just on the Lost Linen Tapes alone. But you kind of answer one of my questions in saying you just did the voice for it. But I wanted to know if you had a say in any of the material that got aired, and did you oversee the script at all for these shows? No. And that was deliberate, not because I was lazy. I wanted to make it very clear, and I think I did, to the people who were working on the program with me and to the the folks at Westwood One, that yes, I knew these people, and yes, I loved them. And no, I was not a, quote, objective DJ or a radio host that was just going to, uh, you know, tie the segments together. I was not that. I was passionately involved with them. And the only way for this show not to be a powder puff show, but to be as honest as we could make it, was for me not to interject myself into what was broadcast. I saw the scripts for the first time when I got to the recording studio and reviewed the language and uh, the actual copy uh, to practice before I would read them. And that's when I discovered the material for the first time. I don't think I ever said to anyone, I don't think we should use that. Or John doesn't come off good in that. Or that person has something really negative to say about John. There was no effort on my part to change anything, including things that, you know, did not show him in the best light. And I I think you could... um, 
hmm. uh, check back with anybody else who worked on the show and ask them the same question. And, and I have a feeling they would say, yes, that's absolutely accurate. I think there was one occasion this was clear to me. I believe at the time there was a show that involved Bob Dylan and the song, uh, Dylan recorded a song called Serve Somebody. Right. It was one of his most successful uh, songs. And he sang it during a period of time when he was going through his own personal religious transition. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I first heard that song, I played it to John, who was in New York. He heard it. He did not like it. And uh, he's had some real issues with uh, with Bob's so-called conversion. And uh, he did a parody of the song, not the most flattering of, pattery, uh, of, uh, of parodies. Mm -hmm. And there came a point in the Lost Lemon Tapes where we did a show comparing the lyrical abilities of uh, John, quote, versus Bob. That was, I think, the nature of that broadcast with uh, audio clips of the two of them speaking, John's recollections of how they met, etc. And uh, Serve Somebody came up, and John you know, had some negative things to say about all that. I saw the copy, and I said, you know, because of the sensitivity of the subject, I would like to uh, call Bob and uh, tell him that we are going to broadcast the parody song. I did not know at that time if he had heard it. And I wanted to give him the opportunity to say something, if he had anything to say. And in fact, I did just that. And um, to paraphrase uh, what Bob told me, he had no uh, objection to the song, the parody being played. Uh, he didn't know what it was about the song that got John so upset. And, you know, he just uh, always loved John, something to that effect. Hmm. So on the follow-up question would be, Elliot, what would you have done if Bob had said to you, oh, no, don't do that. Uh, that would really, really offend me and my faith. Uh, don't play that song. That would be the question. And thank God I didn't have to answer it. Hmm. Yeah. But, but upon reflection, I would have said, play the song. Because, this, because it, was, it was about John. It was about John's perceptions. I feel it was acceptable and journalistically fair to give Bob the opportunity to say something had he chose. But since he right. did not avail himself of that, it, it, journalistically, I, I did the responsible thing. It was the, the only time that comes to mind that... Um, I may have interjected myself into the script. Did Bob tell you what he thought of John's song, Serve Yourself? He hadn't heard it. Mm. Okay. He was aware of it. Somebody else may have mentioned it to him. But uh, he personally, it was, I think at the time, you know, a, a bootleg recording. So um, he, he, he simply hadn't heard it. All right. Um, I know that um, in addition to all the unreleased john lennon's solo music in the show there was unreleased beatles in the show too um i always remember yes, hearing uh white album demos for example was there any problem in clearing any of that well there there did come a point uh somewhere into the show where the subject did come up because it was the lost lennon tapes that was the focal point of it and when it started to move into um other areas I'm told that there was a little bit of resistance to that, and we pulled back in that area. The Lost Lennon Tapes was followed by another radio show, another series called The Beatle Years, right. where there was more of that that was involved. So I don't think the issue would be as much clearance as uh, appropriateness. Because if you were going to do a song, a material that involved the others, shouldn't the others be getting just as much attention as John? Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> now, um, these days, uh, you know, everything is copacetic among the, um, the survivors and uh, the, the 
people who sit on the board of Apple, and you know the Beatles. The, the, all the reps have worked together for so many years, decades now, where they all move as one team. And uh, you, you know, I can cite a hundred examples of Beatles material that required everybody saying we're on board. But back in those days, there was still a little bit of, uh, of tension in the air. Right. Mm. Not anymore. But in those days, did there have to be an agreement with all four parties for the songs to be aired in the show? I can't recall. I can't recall. I was never involved in the legal beagle aspect of it or the ownership of uh, the raw tapes, uh, etc. Uh, certainly, uh, the material that uh, I got or acquired was all gotten through uh, legal appropriate uh, channels. I can tell you that nobody said anything to me. Hmm. Well, I always remember being surprised when the Beatles material appeared. And I wasn't shocked about the, the solo line and stuff, but when the Beatles material aired, you know, usually that, that stuff is so controlled, that material. So um, it was a surprise well, I, to me. I, so. I, I do remember that there did come a point where someone along the way said that we had to withhold. In other words, if John was playing a demo of him writing or singing Strawberry Fields on an acoustic guitar in his living room, that that was okay to air, but that we shouldn't go into the studio with that tape and show examples of individual things that any of the other members were doing solo and how it sounded when it was combined together, blah, 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 blah. In other yeah. words, there were those kinds of distinctions in Minute, but we had the run and there was no, people either liked it or ignored it, but nobody came after us. Yeah, it just sounds very complicated because you can easily look at any material from the Beatle years as being Beatles, even if it's just John alone. So, uh, you know, to make that distinction, it's, it's um, how, how they have this criteria, it's, it's, um, it's kind of, it's complicated. I think complicated. it's those kinds of questions, those are the kinds of questions that help put uh, attorneys' grandchildren through college. <laughs> <laughs> True. Well, I can just tell you that when um, the Lost Land Tapes aired, I was doing my Beatles show in New Jersey, and it aired an hour before my show, and it was, you know, to me, the best radio series ever, because what could be better than looking forward to something every single week that you never heard before, whether it was an unreleased song, an alternate take, a different mix, an interview, there'd always be something every single week, and, uh, you know, it was a great teaser to have <laughs> instead of being handed right. everything all at once to have it you know a piecemeal a little bit each week it made you look forward to the show every single week so i think it was just so well put together oh bless you look um and and i take uh, minimal credit uh, uh, for that there, there were people who really i mean the writing of each one of those shows and the researching of the it was a yeoman's task but he was worth it and if we were to n try today to name 10 people who would be worthy of the same kind of scrutiny uh, for two, three hundred hours without repetition, uh, you know, we might get uh, into dark forests. The thing mm. that I liked about the, the, the thing the most was uh, how much joy it brought to others. I had heard from by then I had been on the air for a long time before I started doing the Lost Lennon tapes. And, you know, from time to time, I would run into people who said that they enjoyed an interview I did with so-and-so or so-and-so. But I do remember the quantity of mail that I received about the, the, the fundamental joy it was to be able to revisit with, uh, with John. And it was a bonus, you know, because when he fell, the belief was that we would never hear his voice again, you know, that there would be nothing, quote, knew there couldn't be he wasn't with us anymore and then suddenly this plethora of material surfaced and we had uh, a slight respite from that just a little bit 
it gave us just a little extra time to visit with him after he was gone. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what the lost linen tapes provided. Right. Yeah, yeah. It, it really did. Before I pass you over to Steve, I just want to ask you, I, I, I look at John as being such a fascinating person, one of the most fascinating people of all time, but a very complicated figure in many ways because he changed his opinions all the time. Do you see that as just, as just part of being normal and part of his appeal? Yes. Or is it frustrating to figure out where he was at? I find it normal, and I think the same could be said about the four of us, unless the <laughs> four of us agree that we have the exact same opinion today about everything that we did three years ago or 30 years ago. I think, you know, the fundamentals remain the same, but uh, do we alter our perceptions with time? We do. He did. Did he sometimes contradict himself? He did, of course. Did he sometimes pull back on a position that he took? Did he occasionally offer an apology? He did as well. He was he was very human. I think people who take exception to that are the ones who fall into what I refer to as the idolatry segment. You know, the people who just worship him and believe that uh, every pronouncement and every word was uh, golden and uh, worthy of preservation in, in an almost biblical sense. And, you know, I, I viewed him as a, just a... If you were talking to him right now, if it wasn't me, uh, he would he would be just as well. You have heard him speak in a thousand different uh, radio interviews, mm -hmm. and you do know that his opinions were subject to change. Not when it came to the the biggies, but the subtle ones or his individual mood. He could be very moody, and if you caught him at an angry time, he could be somewhat vituperative in 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 his uh, expression. Right. It's just a but, very interesting thing. But, but he Good. wasn't he wasn't a phony. He wasn't a hypocrite. It wasn't structured in a way where he was going to try to create a spin and take you along with it. It just could have been, you know, he remembered something he said a day or two before or a year or two before and realized that um he was in a different space when he uttered those words, and now he's uttering different words. And I think that that's just indicative of his humanity. Mm. That's well put. It's just for a lot of people who hang on his every word, they want to know how he stood on every issue. And if you're give changing me, all give, the time... Give me, give me an issue that troubles people who believe he uh, radically changed a, an express point of view. Tell me one. Oh, I don't know if it troubles people, but I can point to several that where he just please, said something complete please. opposite. I can remember there was an interview that he gave to David Wigg where he was talking about the Rolling Stones and how their music never changed and it's all rehash of what they did before and it would be a good scene for them if they would split up. And then a few years later, in one interview, he said that... Um, the Rolling Stones deserve a lot of credit for weathering the storm all these years, you know. So um, I remember him saying that. So it's it's only a difference okay. of a few years when he said that. It's not earth shattering, was, but you know. Was it? I mean, what? Uh, I know you don't have the the stats in front of you, but it seems to me that the David Wig interviews occurred a considerable time earlier than the second comment. I think. Uh, I don't know who he made the second comment to, but I think years had gone by. I think when the David Wig uh, material uh, appeared, you know, he could have just been in a jealous mode that afternoon. Mm. Uh, that uh, you know, he he may have been absorbed in the majesty of Sergeant Pepper, and they may have uh, released Satanic Majesty. And he may have uh, had some uh, issues at the time the question was asked and expressed it. And as a couple of years went by and a couple of albums went by and both groups musically matured and he leveled out and felt more comfortable, he said they weathered the storm. So whatever it was that he originally thought of, in other words, to me, 
I'm not spinning here. I'm not being the media guy. I'm not covering for John. <laughs> but f- to me, it's it, it simply he had an opinion of them at one point that he expressed. And as time went by, that opinion softened. And by the time he reached the end of his life, he and Mick were friends. Uh, I, I don't recall having any lengthy conversations with him about the Rolling Stones. But... You know, John. John was subject uh, was somebody who who did get jealous. That's one of the reasons he wrote the song. It wasn't just about uh, a woman, mm. but there were other <clears throat> things that that did annoy him. Mm. All right. Well, when he has different opinions, they don't disturb me. I just recognize him as being human, like the rest of us. Exactly. Uh, it, 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 when people do raise, and they do frequently, about the, his changing opinions. I, I never felt that there was one that was dramatically or demonstrably different, just different gradations or expression. But he was the, he always seemed pretty much like the same guy that I met in the beginning as the same guy that I said goodbye to at the end. Hmm. Nothing really significant changed. N- nothing that I can remember. Hmm. He didn't come okay. out and say, give war a chance. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he never did. He, he, he never decided he was going to uh, put on a uniform. Well, you know, actually, that, that kind of led to what I was going to ask, Elliot. There was, and I'm, I won't mention the person because I think you know who I'm talking about. But there was a, uh, a story that went around several years ago that John turned more conservative later in life. And yeah. I personally always had trouble believing that. You know, you knew John, you know, you knew, knowing John as well as you do, or did, how do you respond to that story? Do you, what did you think? I remembered when that item appeared, mm-hmm. I think I may have read it on TMZ. Mm-hmm. I was aware, I, I was aware of the source mm-hmm. of the item, mm-hmm. who I did, who I did not consider to be credible, and the item was patently false. Okay. Okay. And the uh, the item alleged that uh, John had developed this great, I believe it indicated that John had developed this great appreciation for from President Reagan. Mm-hmm. I think that was at- attached to that item at the time. It was. And uh, and there simply was no truth to that. I believe the item came out around the time that uh, there was going to be a film released. And that the item had something to do with the promotion of the film. It did. So you, you are correct. It, yes, that is true. So, so um, the the item the item simply isn't true. Okay, talking about uh, Ken. Do you mind if I uh, can I go ahead? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, talking about um, uh, you were you were getting into the uh, uh, humanness of John Lennon. I was thinking about Yoko. A lot of people have seen Yoko as her public persona, but don't really know her as you do outside of the limelight. I had the pleasure of interviewing her a couple of times. The first time she was very, she was very different from what I expected. She was, you know, she was very charming. Really is, is, is the word I guess I I could use. Um, And I'm not trying to lead you on, but how is Yoko outside is outside of the limelight? How is she, you know, as a, as a, uh, how was her, her humanity uh, as far as, uh, you know, being, uh, what, how you knew her, how you know her, I should say. She's very real. And yes, part of what she is, is very charming. And I could go through the, the other adjectives, many of which, uh, uh, I'm frequently criticized for enumerating because it makes me sound like uh, I'm her number one fan. And in a way, I am. What impresses me about her is her uh, sense of generosity, uh, her philanthropy, her involvement in humanitarian efforts, her real sense of innocence, uh, her belief that it's going to get better, that it's not over. She's never wavered from that. She's extremely affirmative. Now, there is also a part of her that is very assertive, very clear, 
Uh, she is a very sober businesswoman. She does not tolerate hypocrisy. She's she's very committed to her belief systems, highly protective of her husband, a really good mom. I mean, I, I've never seen a relationship between a mother and a son as there is between uh, uh, Yoko and Sean. And again, uh, I, I go through the, these litanies and people say, well, yeah, he was paid for by her for, you know, X number of years to say nice things, et cetera. Well, you know, I've been paid by uh, other clients where I just decline personal questions about their lives, you know, and go back to the, the book or the album or the movie. I always loved her sense of imagination, her originality. There were things that she said and did that, to my knowledge, nobody else said and did prior to the time that she said and did them. She's always been provocative. She challenges my thinking. Uh, she, she's a, an avid reader. Con- I mean, far more so than television or, or any other medium. She's also capable, somehow, of having lived these many years and having come under such a fire and been on the receiving end of so many uh, incendiary, demeaning remarks about her and never swinging back, and to the best of my knowledge, never in a lifetime saying anything in a public arena negative about another person, even those who perceived her as some kind of uh, enemy or dragon lady or any of that stuff. She is stoic, uh, but uh, vulnerable and uh, sensitive. And finally, you know, she has never wavered from being the keeper of the wishing well. She's never abandoned her role in terms of the maintenance of the legacy of her husband. And that, that's big stuff to me. You know, that's, talk about having your lover's back. There's much to be said about that when your lover is with you. When your lover is passed and you're still covering his back, it's a big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, I love her. Okay. I'm probably not going to get the answer I'm expe- I, I would want on this question, but <laughs> do you know I, the one thing that everybody oh, everybody keeps crossing their fingers for is let it be. Do you know anything about what the situation is with let it be, Elliot? I don't, which is probably not the answer that you were looking for. <laughs> no, uh, but uh, I, I simply don't. I, I know that there is this belief that uh, I am, you know, an, an up to date authority on Beetle business. I, re- I really am not. Okay. I never have been and was never really included in, you know, I, I, met, I met the four guys, but I was never ever included in Beetle decision making or b- anything of that nature. My friendship was primarily was ex- exclusively with John. With the others, it was passing, although I liked each of them. But I, I would not be the person who would know the answer to that question. Okay. And I'm, before I hand you over to Alan, I'll, let me just ask you, who uh, outside of John and Yoko, uh, I know you posted pictures all the time on Facebook of, who, of, of you with people. Who have you worked with besides John and Yoko? And just for the record, uh, in terms of my late night uh, media mince musings <laughs> on Facebook, um, <laughs> I post the pictures of public figures in an attempt to get somebody to read whatever it is that I'm writing about, which always tries to contain something of an inspirational message and an unashamed invitation for them to visit my free website, where I really feel that there is material. 200 hours of material about a myriad of subjects that could be helpful and useful uh, to people's growth and development. I don't get a dime from doing that, but I um, I'm on, I use Facebook as that portal. And the other point is, you see me with a lot of public figures, but that is not to suggest I personally represented each one of those people. They're friends of mine. Many I did represent. But I posted one yesterday, I think, because uh, I saw Sean Penn over the weekend on Saturday for a little gathering. To, he, he has a new book out now, his first novel, and uh, a group of his friends wanted to celebrate that. We went, we took a picture, I posted it, uh, but Sean is a friend. I've never represented him. I've never worked for him. So I, I always try and clear that up or else they think 
I represented uh, 800 people, including St. Uh, Valentine's. Who else, have you, who else have you represented besides John and Yoko? Who else have you worked with? Oh, God. Oh, gosh. The, I think they're, they're 35 or 40 people that um, I cover over the years. I'm not really one, you know, to wave the the um, the resume in, in front of people's noses. It sounds like I'm self-indulgent. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, whereas I don't publish the client list, magazines and newspapers have, in fact, published my associations with some people because I've had to make public statements on their behalf. And in that context, I spoke for and represented Bob Dylan, Diana Ross, Don Johnson, Melanie Griffith. A flood of names uh, come to my mind. And, and I think if you go on uh, Wikipedia or one of those uh, things, you, you would see 30 uh, names of people, the years. Okay. All right. In, in addition to, uh, to artists, there were CEOs of, of companies, you know, corporate heads, people like that. The only people I haven't represented uh, are politicians. Mm. Okay. And I, and I, and I interviewed 2,000 people on radio and television. So wow. before I became a media, media consultant representing people, the last tab that I took was uh, 2,000 interviews. Okay. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. Alan? Yeah. Okay, so Elliot, um, I can understand why you haven't written a memoir of your um, relationship with John, but in terms of the interviews, the public interviews you did starting from 1971, and there was that um, you know famous one on ABC TV that you did in 73, and you know, and and after that, I, I'm sure you did a lot of um, formal interviews. Have you ever thought of compiling those in a book? Uh, yes, I have. I, I've never thought about writing a memoir, and I have not thought about writing a book about my days with John and Yoko. Uh, that one uh, does not particularly appeal to me. I, I once wrote a chapter. <laughs> I, I once wrote a chapter for a book called The Ballad of John and Yoko, published by Rolling Stone Press, where 12 or 15 different people were asked to contribute uh, their thoughts. And there's a 10-page essay uh, that I wrote for that. I think it took me a month to write the 10 pages <laughs> with a very good editor as well. I'm not good when it comes to, to that kind. Of, I'm not an essayist. I'm more of a a news copywriter or a Facebook uh, quasi-journalist, but uh, I, I, I don't write like uh, Robert Hilburn, you know. In direct answer to your question, sharing my thoughts more publicly or interviews that I did with, uh, with John and Yoko, my position has always been the same. First, Yoko. For the past 25 years, I've said to her that there's only one person qualified to write the ultimate biography of John and uh, John during the years post Beatles, the John and Yoko years. And that would be her because nobody knew him better than her. And I know for years she had considered that idea, toyed with that idea. As of the moment, um, uh, that book has not been written but Yoko goes first. Uh, a gentleman lets the lady do the 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 first move. Mm-hmm. When and I would love to see her write that book, and that would be the book of record. And if she never elects to do it, then I'll consider at that time, but not before. Okay, but what about a compilation of the of the public interviews? You know, just like QAs. Same. The same. I would want them to be in her book uh-huh. first. Okay. I think we're sort of running down the hour, so I should probably pass you back to Ken for one, or, or however many Ken has. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, Ken? I wanted to I like discuss... the expression of, of, of passing back and forth. It, it, for some reason or other, it, it, when you first said it early in our interview, it reminded me of uh, tag team wrestling. <laughs> you know, with a, you know, <laughs> with a narrative, so he's now being passed back to the person in the third corner, so you don't know who's yes. coming up next. Yes. So here here, here we are for four old guys, you know, it would be quite a show. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah, I, I don't think I do well in that arena. <laughs> so, Ken? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to discuss with you, Elliot, the difficulty that many fans have in understanding Yoko and her importance in John's life. To me, I think she will always be the most important person ever in John's life and the biggest influence on him, mainly because she opened up John's mind to accepting that anything can be considered art. Yes. And um, because of the fact that Yoko, a lot of people don't understand her artwork, they don't understand her music. In fact, the media only shows this one side of Yoko when she screams on stage. And that's a very small percentage of the music that she's done anyway. A lot of her music is very poetic and very melodic. And so yes. there's so many people out there that judge her based on what the media shows of her, and they barely know her at all. And so many people that I've spoken to that have said to me that they don't like her can't really explain why. <laughs> So I want to know, is it difficult for you, being a friend of hers for all these years, and is it difficult for her to accept the fact that many fans will, will never, it seems like they'll never give her a chance? Yes. Well, yes to both of your questions. Uh, whereas she has been remarkably resilient after uh, all these many years, of course it's wounding. It's better now. It's much better now than it was when they first married and before we lost John, uh, when she was just uh, the world's uh, punching bag, mm. and uh, she had to take it all the time. It, uh, of course, it impacted her, and it really impacted him, because you're right. She was the love of his life. I mean, the people who criticize her. John addressed that, I believe it was in the last BBC interview, the, the Andy Peoples interview, where he spoke to the fans who criticized her. And I'm just paraphrasing, but he, and you guys might even know the quote where he said, uh, if, uh, if you pretend to care about me, uh, you've got to understand that I'm with her. I'm not with you. I love her something to those words. He, he was constantly declaring his love for her. And when uh, strangers made comments that was not genuine or they didn't like her, well, they couldn't have gotten him. They, mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, there's no way of understanding Lenin without Yoko. And there's right. no way of appreciating John's development in the, in the points that you had just made without her presence. So, you know, the first time he read Grapefruit, that uh, for our listeners who might not be familiar with it, a book that Yoko had written um, in the late 60s, I believe, a series of little instructions, imaginative concepts of things you can do, you know, almost in haiku style, uh, yeah, that really blew his mind. That was, that, that was the thing that determined it. And when he discovered her art and her affirmation, it... it all the reasons that they fell in love, I don't know how fans of his can dismiss her. Pre she was his other half. Mm -hmm. If you have an issue with Yoko, what you're actually saying is I only like or loved half of John. Right. So, uh, so yeah, yes, there is the, uh, and, and also, of course, the issues that we could point to back in the day of her being the dragon lady with overtones of the, of the mixed marriage, possible racism, uh, mm -hmm. the belief that if John had married a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, light-skinned English lady, it would have evoked a different reaction. And yeah, Yoko's controversial. Uh, Yoko uh, did not adopt to the Tammy Wynette uh, commandment. <laughs> uh, she had a mind of, of her of her own, and she started speaking about uh, feminism and women's issues for decades before the last Academy Awards, and a lot of people carry that stuff over as well. So, you know, for many many years of my life, 
uh, during my representation of Yoko and the, and the Leninist state. I guess I was asked more questions about her and trying to explain this phenomena. And I did it to the best of my ability, but it took what happened to get people to feel a sense of compassion for her. And once they felt the sense of compassion and that door was opened a bit and they explored what she was doing by way of the preservation of everything that they stood for, uh, they warmed up to her. So, yeah, there are probably still people who've got an issue with her. But, gosh, uh, if you Google St. Teresa, you will come up with two or three books explaining why she was such a bad person. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That nobody, nobody escapes the wrath of the preconceived issues of the critic. Nobody. How true. Yeah. I've said for many years that, um, you know, and I happen to love so much of Yoko's music and a lot of her art. I don't expect all fans to love her music and art, but if you don't recognize how important she was to John and being the most important person in John's life, then how can you really call yourself a fan of John? Yeah, I mean, that is the issue. Nobody uh, is saying that what we can't have artistic preferences, that we like one singer or song or writer or actor over another in a, in a performance. That's what they do. The subject that we're talking about is who they are. Mm-hmm. So if anybody who has a legitimate uh, issue with uh, uh, Yoko's artistry, they're entitled to that. That's fine. But anybody who has... a uh, an issue with her, somebody who's never met her, never spoken with her, is unfamiliar with her achievements, for them in their lofty uh, uh, lounges uh, to cast dispersions, uh, to me it just seems, it seems absurd. Mm -hmm. And of, of course, the payoff to that is she doesn't fight back. Mm -hmm. She doesn't offer reasons why you should love her. She understands. And finally, finally on that subject, lay off of her. (laughs) She's 85 now. She's done what she has done, which is more than most of us. I would think that in my time with her, she's probably given away $100 million to causes and charities that have helped improve the world. And um, she helped... John evolved into the kind of man that he was that we respect and love so dearly. What more do you want from her? Mm -hmm. Uh I have to say, um, Elliot, were you at the Stanford lecture she gave a couple years, a few years ago? Did you go to that? No, I, 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 no, I missed that one. I was there for that. And I must say everybody that was there that night, I mean, just seeing her, she did the, the cut piece in front of us she did there the mm-hmm. whole it was a multimedia presentation and everybody that was there was you know you got came away with this understanding that you would not have gotten by reading you know newspaper accounts or you know or even some of the beetle books it was it was pretty pretty amazing and and um it, you know i if mean pe- if people really want to understand what you just said Mm-hmm. Uh, tell them to Google Yoko Ono cut piece uh, to see what this work of art involves right. um, that she inspired and that other people have attempted to replicate and just observe it. I don't care if you like it or if you don't like it, but in terms of originality of concept and execution of bravery and thought provocation, that's a work of art. It is, and, and like, and seeing it done in person was, was just an amazing experience. It was, it was, un, you know, that's not something I'm going to ever forget. You know, not because it, even more than it was because it was her. I mean, just the the concept, like you say. I mean, that's an, incre- an incredible concept. I mean, the fact that she was the one that came up with it, and she did it. I mean, that, you know, uh, that's she. I mean, there's that should be credited you know people should realize that she has a hell of a talent that she gave you know that she gave a lot to the world so 
You also, uh, in your uh, description uh, of uh, how you felt after you saw cut piece, you said, uh, quote, that's something that you'll never forget, close quote. Mm -hmm. Um, That was the one thing I was searching for when I was getting that litany of things about her that that so moved me. And um, uh, you you just triggered the thought, among (laughs) everything else, Yoko Ono is unforgettable. (laughs) If you've ever met her, if you've ever experienced her, if you've ever spoken with her, if you've ever participated or gone along this this odyssey, she is a being that remains unforgettable. You cannot say that about many. Okay. Very and, true. And, and, and in my and in my life, well, I, I can't think of anybody who has influenced me more and and, and who's touched my heart and uh, and life uh, to the degree that she has. And if the truth be told. Obviously, uh, I only got to spend eight, nine years with John. I've spent 50 now with Yoko. And when I walked into the Dakota two months ago uh, for the 85th birthday and I saw her, uh, my heart was filled, uh, filled with as much joy and appreciation for who she is, what she's been through, as the first day that we um, met, I cannot imagine my life without her. Can I ask uh, one more question? Um, we all, well, I don't, I mean, everybody else may have other questions. We all saw the picture of Paul McCartney near the Dakota during the uh, March for Our Lives um, rally. Did Paul contact her that day? I don't know. I haven't spoken to her since the, uh, the march. Uh, I thought that was a very courageous um, thing for him to do. Mm-hmm. And just being out on this, I just saw the little clip on CNN, mm-hmm. and just being out on the street with everybody else, not trying to call undue attention to himself, uh, just trying to deliver a message that's printed on his T-shirt with his wife with him. And the the, the very simple words that he said, were extremely impactful. Uh, Paul can uh, use his great economy in, in his expression, uh, oftentimes in his in his work, in his music, and sometimes in his public pronouncements. And uh, just seeing him there with everyone else, sharing his uh, point of view, I thought was uh, extremely moving. And I don't know uh, if uh, they saw each other on that day. Okay. Gentlemen, uh, I'll, I'll hand it back if anybody's got anything else to ask. Okay. I just have one question. Go one, ahead. one last question. Sure. Go ahead, Ellen. Um, Elliot, I know okay. you said that, that you just saw Sean at uh, Yoko's 85th birthday party. Have you spent any time getting to know Julian in any way? And what do you think of him and, and Sean as people as well as artists? Because they both have recorded quite a lot of music now. <laughs> Julian and Sean, and I'm, I personally am so impressed with the two of them. I wanted to know what your opinion was. Indeed. Uh, I'm enormously impressed with the two of them, and I don't know Julian to the degree that I know Sean, but John introduced me to Julian when Julian couldn't have been more than uh, 12, 13, and uh, came out to Los Angeles to visit him, and it was in the early morning hours that uh, I heard John screaming uh, at the top of Laurel Canyon where I lived, Elliot, wake up, wake up, wake up. I want you to meet my son. And <laughs> um, I woke up and he, I got the feeling that John had been up from the night before. And uh, there was Julian. They came into the house and he said that they were on their way to the L.A. Zoo or Disneyland or something like that. Would I go with them? I had only had an hour's worth of sleep at that time. And I said, let me catch up with you afterwards. That's where I met Julian. I would see him... Uh, again, uh, uh, in, uh, on December 9th, 1980 at the Dakota, where mm. I spent the better part of, of the week with him, trying to take him outside of the building to other places where he would have a chance to breathe and, uh, and not be caught up in, you know, the, the crowds and the press and the rest of it. Uh, he later would become a neighbor of mine on Mulholland Drive, 
and I would see him frequently, uh, 10, 20, 30 times. He would cook dinners for me. I would attend uh, parties uh, that he threw. Uh, we uh, correspond. Uh, I saw him last, last year uh, at his photo exhibition. He takes photographs now, brilliant photographs sure. in L.A., uh, we uh, emailed each other two nights ago because he is currently en route to L.A. He has a new children's book that's going to be um, published uh, this week, and he's going to have a signing uh, party, and uh, I intend to uh, to go there. So in terms of knowing him, spending time with him, hanging out with him, yes, we did. I briefly represented him to some public relations matters many, many years ago. Uh, I have great love in my heart for him. And uh, he and Sean are on the best of terms. They've always been on the best of terms. They view themselves as brothers. They are very supportive of each other and love each other. I know I talk more about Sean than I do uh, Julian, simply because I've known him longer and I've known him best. You know, he's on this turf. I don't get to Europe where Julian lives that uh, often, Uh, but he's John's son, you know? Mm. I have to love him the way I love Sean because of that shared lineage and also as a a person, as a sensitive being. Uh, Not to plug my website again, but if you go on the website... You'll listen to Julian and I talking for about an hour, and you hear this degree of uh, sensitivity and clarity. He's a very romantic guy. He's a great chef. He's a marvelous artist, a great photographer. I, I have I have much respect for for Jules, and uh, and I hope you know in the years ahead, I do have the opportunity to get to know him a little better. Actually, Elliot, you introduced me to Julian. <laughs> I when, did. When we was did, that? It was in New York when we did that interview about the Lost Lennon tapes, and and I remember when you when he he came to your um, door as uh, as we were really finishing up, and uh, and I remember what you said, which was which struck me as not well a little strange, but it sounded to me like it was some sort of inside language between you and him, where um, you introduced me to him and you said so alan's been here to talk about the experience (laughs) yeah yeah um um, i'm trying to remember what was going through my mind at the time (laughs) i i figured that he you know he he would just take it as the experience of you know john (laughs) you know in a way something like that and he was 16 at the time probably well, it was. Have 80, we been drinking wine? <laughs> well, it was eighty-eight. So I think his his first album had already been out, um, possibly even the second. And where did what the year was that? Nineteen eighty-eight. It was in uh, New York. I can't remember exactly. Was it? A, you were staying in a hotel, and that's where we did the interview. And um, and oh, he knocked the on the door. The hotel. Yeah. Yeah. I, mm. I I don't have a firm recollection of the moment. Julian and I did speak in a kind of uh, mysterious linguistic uh, interaction, and my guess is we were drinking wine at the plaza, you and I, <laughs> before the interview <laughs> began. I won't ask you to say yes or no to that question, but uh, he's a he's a wonderful guy. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, this has been an amazing, amazing hour and a half. Uh, this has been incredible. Thank you for taking the time, Elliot. Uh, yes, thanks. I thank uh, the three of you. I mean, you look, the three of you are really expert in this material and your preservationists at heart and uh, and journalists as well as people who, who uh, loved the subject that we're talking about. And uh, I, I've done probably more than my share of, uh, of interviews in terms of these recollections. But this one really felt like um, uh, kind of a family gathering, and I enjoyed it very, very much. And uh, I thank you for having me on your show. You're Thanks very you welcome, know. and and That's maybe right. and and hopefully uh, at some point in the future we can we can do this again. Uh, this has been really incredible. Since we're running so late, I'm not gonna. I, I think we should probably just 
forego with the uh, uh, the usual uh, a lot of the usual stuff and say um, you can write to us at things we said today at gmail dot com. We have a Facebook page. Ken, I, I did mention your syndication um, news at the front, and I think maybe you want to mention that before we sign off. Yeah, very quickly. Uh, there's a brand new internet only radio station called UnitedDJs.com. And this is um, something that was put together by Tony Prince, who is a legendary uh, DJ in the UK. He used to be on Radio Caroline and Radio mm-hmm. Luxembourg. And he had this dream of uh, putting together DJs from the 60s on up from different countries and having them all on one radio station doing their thing. And it's very personality-driven radio like it used to be. So there are DJs from the UK, from the US, from Canada, and Australia. And they're taking my Beatles show. Every little thing. Fantastic. And it's, mm-hmm. Yeah. Fantastic. It's, would, you, would, would you recite the, um, the, the link one more time slowly for everybody to catch? <laughs> okay. Well, the, the, um, the radio station's called United DJs. And... You bring them up by, well, the URL is united, then DJ, the letters DJ, dot com. And if anyone was brought up on radio in the 60s, or maybe you've heard of DJs from the UK in particular, that you never had a chance to hear, like Tony Prince or uh, Mike Reed, for example, Um, Eddie Mm -hmm. Grant. Eddie Grant, the same guy who gave us the song Electric Avenue. Right. I saw that I because I visited the website earlier, and I went, Eddie Grant is there? Wow. Yeah, he does a radio show. There's all kinds of programs there. I'm so into this whole idea because I get to hear all these DJs whose names I've heard before but never got to hear it all. Mm-hmm. And, so, and, and the funny thing is, the reason I got this uh, gig was because my, my Beatles show, Every Little Thing, was on a station in Canada. One of the DJs there loved my show, recommended it to Tony Prince, and I'm actually listed as a Canadian DJ. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't care how I get on, <laughs> but uh, I'm not hilarious. Canadian, folks. That's wonderful. Elliot, you, didn't get, you never gave the um, URL for your website. Would you, oh, yes, you want to give you. that? Uh, sure. And again, again, Ken, uh, congratulations. The, uh, oh, I, I, yes. I, I wrote that down, and I, I will go on that tonight just to take a listen. That that just sounds like a fabulous idea, and you belong on it. As oh, for me, uh, for those uh, who wish to um, sample my website, it's free. There's, you're not asked to do anything, and you don't have to leave your, your name or your P.O. box, or we don't follow you or any of those things. It's just Elliot Mintz. Dot com. That's E L L I O T M I N T Z dot com. It contains 200 hours of material, including interviews that I've done with uh, a number of people, including, of course, uh, John and Yoko and Ringo and Julian, and a three hour video interview with uh, Sean on O'Lennon. And you just might get a kick out of it. And then go back to listen to Ken's new uh, show. <laughs> That's great. I think I'm hiring you as my publicist. <laughs> <laughs> I don't Elliot, want to do that anymore. Mm. Elliot, once again, thank you for taking the time and doing this. This has been um, uh, this is something. This is going to be a memorable interview. I, I guarantee it. Anyway, gentlemen, I think we can safely uh, put this one to bed. <laughs> For Ken Michaels, Alan Cozen, and our special guest, Elliot Mintz, this is Steve Marinucci for Things We Said Today, saying thanks for listening, thanks for supporting us, and we will see you next time.